Hello and welcome to Module 2 in the Patterns and Practices Getting Started with the Core Components Series. I'm Patrick Rogers, Senior Program Manager with Office 365, and I'll be walking you through basic operations with the Core Component. So for those of you not familiar with the Patterns and Practices group and what uh, we're up to, it's uh, code samples, guidance, we have monthly community calls, published case studies, as well as uh, we're starting special interest groups covering a variety of topics. And to get involved, you can follow the uh, link there, the AKA MS Office Dev PNP will get you to the root and allow you to get started and engaged with the program in any of the many ways. So hope to, to hear from the folks watching the videos. So our agenda for today is going to be very demo heavy. So not a lot of slides. I'm going to walk you guys through a hands-on lab and getting started. I am going to cover why, we, why you would want to use the Patterns and Practices core component. Like I said, we'll get into that demo. And then a couple of quick closing remarks um, as we finish out. So why use the core, uh, core components at all for basic functionality? Um, there's three main reasons, um, and these are kind of the three main reasons you would use any uh, tested library. So repeatability, the code is tested, and we're following established patterns and patterns that, uh, that we and Microsoft have found uh, to work and uh, to be kind of uh, the best route to do some of these different things. Um, and in some cases, uncovering some functionality that is uh, possible, but a little bit hard to get to through the API. Um, and that leads us into simplicity. You can replace large blocks of code with these existing patterns and practices methods, as well as wrapping, uh, like I said, some of this complex functionality in more easier to consume methods, um, you know, that, that turn multiple lines into single lines and calls like that. So we'll take a look at that in the hands-on lab. And then as well as supportability, um, there's a lot of support for both very common and also some more complex actions in the library. And those will, uh, some of the more complex stuff we'll look at in later modules in the series. Um, and this one we'll look at kind of some getting started uh, with the core stuff. But it's, it's supported by the community. So we do have monthly updates to address uh, bugs that are found as well as including enhancements. So it's a great way to stay up to date with some of the latest uh, techniques and possibilities as uh, the product evolves uh, both online and on-premises. So covering a little bit why, let's go ahead and jump right into looking at a demo. So what, what this hands-on lab uh, I'm gonna walk through is really looking to do is showing you a couple of, of pieces of core functionality that folks do a lot with the client-side object model and SharePoint. We're going to be, in this case, looking at SharePoint Online, um, but converting that to use some of the core methods and see some of the uh, productivity gains there and just the reduction in overall code, um, which, which certainly helps with deployment as well as um, getting started. So with that, we'll jump over to the demo. So now that we're in Visual Studio, um, I can go ahead and start to show you what we've done um, here for the hands-on lab, which I'm going to walk you through. And what I've done is created a new project, so file new, and it's a provider-hosted app. I have um, gone ahead and installed the NuGet package for the core components. Um, so that's already been done. That was covered in the first module. You can see that here. I've already done that. And I'm targeting SharePoint Online. So that's the, the uh, package I installed. And then I updated the index uh, view, the home view, um, to have a single button. And that button just calls to an example controller. So it just posts back into, or actually does a get request in the same application and calls this controller. So this controller is where we're going to be doing all our modifications, making all our changes. And the first thing I wanted to point out is I have just commented out, I'm ignoring the anti-forgery token. Um, for production application, you definitely want to uh, validate the requests that are coming in to do changes like this. You don't want things like this uh, to be done on a get request. This hands-on lab uh, was made to be as simple as possible, so I didn't handle any of that stuff. But in production, you absolutely want to make sure you cover that. Um, so I wanted to mention that before we get started. 
The next piece here is I'm using Authentication Manager out of the core component. I won't dive into this too much because there's going to be another entire module on the Authentication Manager, but this really simplifies uh, getting uh, an authenticated context, in this case, an app-only authenticated context. Um, if you've ever done this, there's lots and lots of code, lots and lots of callbacks, things to worry about. Here, all I have to do is give it the URL, an ID, and a secret, and I'm able to get an authenticated app-only context uh, for my site. So really helpful there. Um, one other thing to enable that um, is, as you're familiar with in the permissions, we've updated the checkbox to allow app-only calls. And for the purposes of the lab, I've just set full control on the web, just so permissions aren't in the way at all. Again, in production, this is something you would want to limit your apps to have just the permissions they require to do the work you need to do. So you don't want to over permission your apps um, just to solve kind of the permissioning problems. Um, but I've done that for this lab uh, just to make it as simple as possible so we're not running into you know, access denied and stuff like that. So the authentication manager will allow us to get our authenticated context. So this will be an authenticated context. And now we can look at some boilerplate uh, CSOM code that if you've ever written any um, client library code, you're very familiar with uh, these kind of uh, calls and, and methods and sort of patterns. Um, and for example, what we're going to do is some very basic things like create a list. We're going to create a view on that list. We're going to set a web property. And I also have this requirement to set a web property as indexable. Um, so you can actually set properties to be indexable by search. Well, I don't know how to do that. There isn't an API way to do that. There's no really great documentation on how to do that. So as a developer, I'm, I'm stuck on, on my final requirement of setting that web property as indexable. Um, but I can create a list. Um, I can create a view. And I can, I can set a web property, certainly. So I've done these things. And I'm going to hit F5. And we're going to just launch our project with just the vanilla um, CSOM calls in there. So this is uh, so far not showing any of the patterns and practices core uh, libraries at all. Um, this is just straight vanilla functionality um, coming out of uh, SharePoint. So I'm being asked to trust my app. So I'm going to go ahead and trust it. Again, standard SharePoint app deployment stuff. And then as our app loads up, we'll get redirected over to the local host. And so we've got our button. We'll click our button. It's going to get a little message pop up that says complete. And so how can we see that it's complete? We'll go to our site. We'll refresh the site. And you can see um, here's our list, no PNP2. And if we go in there, our default view is our new view with a title and a modified column. So. Not a crazy great example, but showing you that's the vanilla kind of CSOM way of doing this. So we'll go ahead and close this. And what I want to show you now is um, sort of simplifying this with the Patterns and Practices core library. So the first thing we can do is um, look at execute query. And execute query is uh, a method we've all called 100 thousands of times. Um, but execute query, you may not be aware, is subject potentially to throttling. So if your site is under very heavy load, if your site uh, has a lot of traffic or even if bursts of traffic, some of your requests may get throttled, which is essentially rejected by the server. The server would say, I'm too busy. I can't do your, do your request right now. I can't handle your request. And so when that happens, your applications, you'll start to see some very unexpected behaviors and some behaviors that uh, are very kind of kind of difficult to diagnose. Um, so really, what you want to do is you want to capture those failures specifically related to throttling, and you want to retry them. That's certainly code you could write. Um, you know, no reason you can't. But um, the first uh, method to really take a look at in the core library is a method called execute query retry. And I'm just going to take execute query retry, and I'm going to replace each of the instances in my vanilla CSOM call with this uh, CSOM code with this method call. And this is implemented as are most of 
the uh, core methods as an extension method. So it's a drop-in one-to-one replacement for execute query. It uh, will go right off the, your client context object. And what that does is bottle up that retry functionality for you should the, uh, and I'm going to hit F5 as I'm talking. So should the uh, request be throttled or rejected, um, it's going to get retried for you automatically. Um, so this is kind of a, a really great starting point um, for using the core library is execute query retry. Um, you can update all your existing code with that method um, with no additional changes or configuration changes. Um, so I can click execute the example. I'll get another list created just as before. And if we had throttling, we wouldn't have to worry about it. So execute query retry is a really uh, valuable method. And it's also a very easy way to sort of start bringing the core functionality into your existing code. One-to-one um, -one drop in replacement. So definitely the, the starting place for using uh, the core library. But so let's go a little bit further. Let's go a little bit deeper and look at, so we've got creating a list and a view and a web. Um, it's code you're familiar with, but it's hard sometimes to remember that I need a list creation information. It's a lot of different lines. I have to remember to load and execute the query. So one of the things that the patterns and practices library does for you is create a lot of these one line methods. So this is again, another extension method. So we're gonna create our list and this is giving it the type, the title, and as well, does it require versioning is that. And there's some additional properties you can specify, but I've kept it pretty minimal uh, for the example. And the second piece, we need to create our view on the list. So instead of all these lines of code, we can actually bottle that up into just a single create view line. Now, uh, behind the scenes is doing the same things we were doing, but this is much simpler and is actually a much uh, faster dev story. I don't have to remember all those different steps. I can say list create view, and this will walk me through based on the parameters what I wanna do with that list. Um, and as well, there's some additional parameters that take some defaults, um, stuff like that. So it can really help things out. And you'll see the same thing again for uh, setting a web property in the property bag is now a one-liner call as well. And now we're also gonna be able to introduce, here's an example of I mentioned um, opening up some functionality that doesn't necessarily exist. Um, I'm not gonna say out of the box because it's obviously part of the API if we can call it, but in this case, it's uh, functionality that is very difficult um, to wrap your head around, it's not very well documented. And this is a good example of adding this index property bag key. So behind the scenes, that's actually getting another web property bag, manipulating some XML inside it, doing a bunch of stuff. Um, so instead of having to worry about that, we've provided a method for you here on how to do that simply again as a one-liner. The other thing I'm gonna mention about this code is you'll notice I am, I am no longer calling execute query retry. Um, what happens in the, with a, a lot of the patterns and practices methods, um, that is called for you. And the advantage of that is create list. Your list has been created at this point. Um, create view, your view has been created at that point. So that code is being executed behind the scenes to create these things for you. As well for the set property bag value and the add index, those are done for you. No need to call um, execute query uh, retry yourself, that's being done. So we've replaced, I don't know, what was that 20 or 30 lines of code with four. We've actually introduced some additional functionality we didn't have um, before or didn't have easily accessible before is a better way to say that um, using the index property bag. And so now we can come and run the same code. I'm gonna execute that example. Same thing will happen. We get a complete message. Close that, I'll go back to our site. We'll hit F5. And so here's our with PNP list. It's been created, we've got our new view and we've got our two columns. And you can trust me that the web property bag values have been added uh, successfully. So looking back at our code, um, functionally nothing really different is happening. It's just a much easier development story. It wraps up a lot of common actions um, into this. Um, so two uh, other points I want to touch on. 
Um, if you're doing some applications that are very uh, performance intensive, that are uh, called a lot, um, you do lose the idea of batching requests in a lot of this stuff. So if you were going to create several lists in a row and you wanted to batch that and call execute query once, you can't really do that with the core component. You would want to pull that code out, but still use execute query retry in that case. Um, so that's uh, something to keep in mind you know, as you're going through this. So next steps for the hands-on lab is you can basically browse the methods that are available um, through IntelliSense, and you can see a lot of these extension methods that have shown up. So creating fields, creating views from XML, um, getting base templates, all sorts of these methods. And you'll see these on the web object, list, um, content type, etc. All these things are going to be here. So you can browse these methods, start to play with what the different um, things are you can do. Um, for example, here's get property bag value as a string. There's also one to get a property bag value as an integer. So it's a great place to start browsing through that code and looking at um, you know, some of the different functionality that's out there. Um, as a further next step, you can actually check out the GitHub repo. Um, the link is going to be there in the project for you, but this is the site. And in this site, um, this is actually the source code for the library that you get as that NuGet package. Um, and so I'll just show you the one folder, the app model extensions folder. You can see in here, um, this is all the source code for doing all the different pieces of functionality um, you know, that, that come out as those extension methods. So this does a couple of things. It can show you uh, what's available. It's another resource to go check out um, exactly what's available in the library, as well as um, checking out uh, how things were implemented. So for example, if you want to see how execute query retry, how that method was implemented, you can come to this library and look at the implementation for this or any of the other methods. Um, so it's a very, again, valuable learning resource to come to the repo, look at how things were implemented, um, look at, again, it's a great resource to see how to create a list, how to create a view, look at how that code works, and understand the library a little bit better. So again, another valuable resource. Um, please do uh, check that out. And then a lot of the later modules, or all of the later modules, will be looking at um, more deep dives into specific pieces of functionality within the repo. So what we've done is a very simple getting started, quick replace, um, execute query retry, again, is, is your first entry point into the library. And then starting to replace your blocks of code with the single method calls is kind of the next step um, in absorbing the library and starting to use it. Um, you'll see later there's uh, going to be modules on authentication manager. Uh, the provisioning engine, which is actually kind of another uh, abstraction layer up where you can provision sites through declarative XML. Um, so that's going to be a great module as well. So make sure to check out those and the rest of the series. So thank you very much from myself, Patrick, and the rest of the Patterns and Practices team, and look forward to talking with you soon. Thanks.